So growing up, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. My parents got a divorce when I was in middle school, and uh, that was a really hard time and really defined my relationship with my dad. I blamed a lot of just the destruction in our family on him. My dad was very angry and he yelled a lot. I could never do anything that ever lived up to his standard. And I struggled a lot with the image that my dad was portraying to us as a father. And early on in, in high school, I got invited to a youth ministry at a local church. And it was through that ministry that God really started speaking to me. And, but also, I struggled with knowing my Heavenly Father because of the image I had of, of my father. There was a moment um, in time, my freshman year in high school, where I gave my life to Christ. I fully understood what it meant to have a relationship. That drastically changed the way that I viewed everything in life. Um, even my relationship with my father, my dad uh, and I began a process of restoration <laughs> in our relationship. And part of that was my dad coming to know Christ. I, I remember we were on a long road trip together and my dad had, had come to know Christ and had been several years later. And in that moment of just me and him on this long car ride, my dad began to ask for forgiveness for the years of, of just struggling in our relationship, but just the anger that he had and the way that um, he responded to us as, as kids growing up and was totally kind of took by surprise. Um, my dad was a very tough guy and for him to to ask for forgiveness was, was huge. I had never heard him um, ever ask for forgiveness and I totally at that moment said, Dad, I forgive you. My experience with Christ and how God had forgiven me of my sin because of Jesus' sacrifice led me to a point where I had to forgive him. And, and it was awesome because uh, I just now had this relationship with my dad that I always wanted to have, but never could connect. And it was only because of Jesus and just how God took something that was broken and put it back together and made this beautiful picture. If I could encourage my dad in one way today it would be that you showed the greatest example of just asking for forgiveness. And that has impacted me so much in my life today as a father of three, that I'm gonna mess up and I'm gonna make mistakes, but that, that I'm pursuing Christ and asking for forgiveness and showing them by example of what it means to follow Christ, that it's messy, it's, it's not perfect, uh, but it's this pursuit after Him. I think so much of who God is and who we believe him to be is shaped by our dad and our father, our earthly father. And I want to live a life that, that constantly reflects that image of who our heavenly father is. And in no way am I perfect at doing that, but that's the way that I want to live my life as a dad is, is to constantly reflect the image of who our heavenly father is. And so that they see this beautiful picture of who, who God is, that he loves them, that he cares for them. Um, and that he wants to be with them. I want to welcome you to our, to our hour today. Uh, especially I want to welcome those of you that are, that are fathers uh, today. Some of you in the crowd that are fathers, you've been a father for a short time, maybe days, weeks, or months. And some of you have been fathers like I've been for decades now. But whatever the case, I want to wish you a a truly happy Father's Day today. I, I believe being a father is one of the greatest gifts that God can give someone. It, it comes with, with laughter and tears, most certainly. It comes with mountaintops and valleys, sometimes deep valleys. But I think it's one of the greatest gifts that God might give someone. I've been struck by something about, about this deal being a father for a long time. Quentin referred to it. What I'm struck with is this, is, is that God has invited us to call him Father. That's the name he's given us to refer to him as. And for those of us that are dads, he's given us his name to be called that by our children. And it's clear that his intention of that very specifically has been that, that our children would see us as fathers and we'd see a reflection of, of him, of their heavenly father, of God their father. And our children would see us 
They would understand God's heartbeat. They would understand how God loves them, how God treats them, how God leans into them. They would see all of that in us. And, and it, it's, this, it's this huge honor he gives us, but it's this daunting responsibility. I, I've been um, both a father and a follower of Jesus for over 35 years now. And as the 35 years have unfolded, I've become increasingly aware of the great chasm between who I am and who God the Father is. But I've also experienced God's great grace for me as a father. I've experienced his forgiveness for me, his patience for me, his encouragement for me, his guidance, even his discipline for me as a father, his transformation of me as a father. And I've experienced he's never given up on me as a father. In my worst times, my lowest times, he's never given up on me. And for all of you fathers out there, I will say this, he has never, nor will he ever give up on you as well. So I wanna take this time, I wanna encourage those of you that are fathers along with me. And I wanna consider one very particular area about our role as, as fathers that you and I might grow in. So I'll be speaking directly to you fathers, but I recognize that there are a lot of you in the crowd, actually probably the majority in the crowd that are not fathers. And so allow me to speak to the fathers, but if you'll listen in, you'll find some things that will apply so directly to you as well. But this is especially for those of you out there that are dads, that are fathers. Proverbs 18, 21 says, the tongue can bring death or life. There's this power of words that can either tear down or it can build up. And, and I wanna talk with us as dads, us, us as fathers, about life-giving words from a father. I wanna give us four things that our children need to hear from us. Four things our children need to hear from us. The first is this, and you've already heard this once today from the video, the first they need to hear is, I'm sorry, please forgive me. When we make a mistake, when we err, when, when we're at fault, our children, whatever age they are, need to hear us say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Now, dads, you might be thinking that, that apologizing will undermine your authority. And the reality is that apologizing actually will legitimize our authority. Uh, apologizing when we're wrong will say that we're someone worthy of having some authority, worthy of being trusting, of being trusted. We're, we're safe to have authority over someone when we give our apology. When we apologize, we teach our children how to apologize, make it easier for them to say, I'm sorry, please forgive me when they err as well. I have a long list of, of illustrations I could give about times I've had to apologize and fathers, I'm sure you do as well. I'll give you only two and I have to tell you, it's been painful to even remember these two this week. It's painful to even speak of them, but maybe it, would, maybe it will connect with you as a dad as well. There was a, an evening meal. Our sons were probably teenage, early teenage years, I would guess. And, and I'm sure that there was some escalation of emotions and behavior and all that. All of that I've forgotten. The only thing I remember about that meal was that there came a point that I reached over and in anger slapped one of our sons across the face. And it was, it was so wrong, it was so damaging, it was so uncalled for. And I remember the, the only good part I recall is, is setting aside time very soon after that, that very evening, and sitting down with that son and saying, I am so very sorry. You know, what I did was so wrong, would you please forgive me? And in the context, I said, yes, there are some things that you did that were wrong, and we'll talk about those later. But we have to begin by talking about what I did that was wrong. I am so very sorry, will you please forgive me? I can think of another time, and I, I know exactly where it was in the hallway. Uh, one of our sons was a teenager at the time, and uh, there was a discussion that moved into an argument, and, and I came to a point of, of getting way too close physically and shouting and yelling at my son. And, and had, to, had to then, um, you know, soon after, had to go to this son and say, I am so very sorry. I'm so, would you please forgive me for what I've just done? I could give you, we could spend the rest of my 30 minutes on examples of the times I've had to apologize. And, and dads, I know you're not different than I am. If we got together, all of us in this collective worship hour now, if we got together, we could write volumes of books about times that we've made mistakes, we've erred, we've been wronged. We've been wrong, I should say, we've been wrong. 
times that we have or times that we should have said, I am so sorry, please forgive me. And, and when we do that, when we say that, there's this message that I would encourage us as dads to say as well. When we've gotten, when we've spoken those words of, I'm sorry, please forgive me, at some point before the conversation's done, I think we should say, I want you to know this, son or daughter, I, I am flawed, but your heavenly father's perfect. Yeah, I, I'm your father, but I, I am flawed, but you have to know this, that your heavenly father is perfect. I will fail you. I have failed you. God will never fail you. I'm flawed. Marie and I, um, at least twice when our sons were teenagers, sat down with them once on a trip in a rental car driving someplace and then once at home sat down with them and had this honest conversation and said, we love you so much. And the truth is we've done our very best as parents. We've done our very, very best but reality is the day will probably come that you will need counseling because of us. <laughs> that day will probably come. So what we encourage you is when you get your first job, start setting aside money for that counseling because you'll need it because of us, even though we've done our very best. Now, they probably would have appreciated it even more if we had said, we'll, we'll pay for the counseling, but we didn't. We're off the hook for that. But it was just acknowledging we, we, we love you, but we were flawed. We, we're flawed parents and Today, Father's Day, I'm, I'm a flawed father, but, but my son's heavenly father's not. He is perfect. He will never fail them. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. The second thing they need to hear from us is quite simply and powerfully, I love you. I love you. I grew up in a home where I was, I was deeply loved, and I felt very loved. But somewhere along as the years unfolded, um, the words I love you seem to go out of vogue and probably something to do with it was that it was a house with two boys and two boys who would roll their eyes when they were told they were loved and, and two parents that came through the depression in World War II. And, and so at some point in my growing up years, the words I love you just simply disappeared. And they wouldn't come back until what I would call the Marie effect. My wife's name is Marie and Marie's had many effects upon me and, and our family. But two in particular, uh, she brought the words, I love you back, and she brought hug hugging into existence. In fact, when I, Marie and I had a blind date, our, our first uh, time to, to have a date, had a blind date, we're introduced, and Marie simply closes the distance and gives me this big hug. And it blew my socks off as a guy that had not been hugged in many, many years. Blew my socks. I have... To this day, I've not recovered from that hug. And, and the hugs at some point began to spread into my mom and dad as well. And my dad was the last holdout. But those last years of his life, he became the best hugger I've known. I mean, the, the bear hugs from my dad, I can feel to this day. But she brought back the words, I love you as well. At some point in the relationship, maybe when we were engaged, maybe in the early years of marriage, she would begin to say to my dad and to my mom, I love you. And, and this sweet young daughter-in-law, they would begin to say the words back, I love you. And somewhere along the way, I began to say that, they began to say that to me. And, and now my dad's been in heaven for over 25 years, but I can't count the times I have memories of my dad saying to me, I love you. They are priceless. They're deeply, deeply priceless times. Dad, if that has not been your norm, the first time you attempt to say that, I can promise you it will be very awkward. And if your child is very far along in years, it will be awkward for them perhaps as well. But I can't urge you enough to go there, push through the awkwardness, say I love you, however good or bad it goes, come back again when some time passes and say I love you again and again and again. Can't tell you the number of men that I know grown men that I know who long for their dads to once say, I love you. Can't tell you how many men I know farther down in life whose dads are now deceased and have never heard the words from their dad, I love you, and mourn that and grieve that to this day. Our kids need to hear from us those powerful words, I love you. And when we give them those words, sometimes we need to add some words. This is the message we need to add. As much as I love you, your heavenly father loves you infinitely more. I mean, that's the message they need to hear. I love you, yes, but even, even better than that, as much as I love you, your heavenly father loves you infinitely more. 
The third thing they need to hear from us is I'm proud of you. And specifically, they need to hear I'm proud of you for, for character traits, not for results. Maybe to say I'm proud of you because I saw the effort you gave your very best. I'm proud of you because I see deep kindness in you. I see love in you, generosity, perseverance, courage, grace. The list could go on and on. But, but I'm so proud of you because who I see you to be. But, but it's, a, it's a dangerous slope to go down to say I'm proud of you because you accomplished this. Because you brought home the gold medal. Because you got first place because you won some. It's a dangerous slope to go down. I'll give you an example. When I was in first grade, I've spoken of this recently. I grew up in the deep South Texas, Rio Grande Valley. And in first grade, nearly my entire school was, uh, was Hispanic. And so, so English was my first language. And virtually all my classmates, English was a second language. They already knew Spanish fluently. I knew nothing of Spanish. They were already into the second language deep into it. But, but I was fluent. I'd had six years of English. So first grade, a lot of it is just getting English down pat, and I am a superstar. Man, six years of it, I, I got it wired, so I go home with all A's on my report card, and, and I, I don't know the words spoken, but I, I, I got this impression that my parents were really proud of me because I was exceptional. That's what I got. And I, they, never, they, they never really meant that, probably never even said that. That's what I took away as a six-year-old, that, that you're proud of me because, because I'm, I'm exceptional. And so for the next 40 years, I would find I would grade my own life, my own performance on whether or not I was exceptional. And the truth is, I'm not exceptional at much. And some would say my, my last time of being exceptional was in the sixth grade, I'm sorry, the first grade, six years old, I peaked then. 40 years of, of having this sense of I've only really accomplished, I've only achieved, it's only good if what I've done has been exceptional. Now, again, my folks, that was never their heart. I doubt they ever said that's what I took away. So, so dads, you and I need to tell our kids, I'm so proud of you. We need to help them understand it's because of who they are. It is who they are, not for what they've accomplished. When we started the harbor, 22 and a half years ago, we started the harbor. My, my dad had been in heaven four years. My father-in-law said some words to me that have stayed with me for all of these years now. So a little bit of background on that. Uh, when, I, when I married his only daughter, I was in the oil business and um, all of the things that came with that, all the, all the stuff that came with that and all the affluence that came with that. And, and 15 years in, um, Marie and I go to her parents and say, uh, this is how you, Rick is feeling led and going to quit the oil business, go to seminary, become a pastor. And, and they, they were surprised. They supported us in, in, in all of that. And so I went through seminary. All of our money's gone. Go, begin to work in a, a denomination. And while there wasn't much money, which was fine, there was a lot of security. No doubt we would always eat there. And the day came that we went back to Marie's parents and said, now uh, Rick is feeling led to start a church from scratch. And so Marie's dad, her, his entire framework of life, he was a lifelong Roman Catholic. And so his entire framework was a, this Roman Catholic church, and he'd known a lot of priests. He'd known some great priests, but he'd never known a priest to leave the Roman Catholic church and start a church with nothing. And so here's his son-in-law taking his only daughter to go start a church with nothing. And, and I can, I'll never forget him coming to me. Probably the next time we visited them, we were only, I don't know, 30 minutes apart, 40 minutes apart from them. Next time we visited, he, he pulls me aside and he says, I, I just want you to know, I am so proud of who you are and I believe in you. My dad was in heaven. My father-in-law was here and he was saying those profound words to me. I am so proud of who you are and I believe in you. And this is the message we need to sometimes say to our kids when we say, I'm proud of you. We need to say, you bring joy to your heavenly father's heart. You bring joy to your heavenly father's heart. That's what it means when I say to my sons, I'm so proud of you. I, I, I know what I'm saying about them is something that brings joy to their heavenly father's heart. Sometimes I'll say, I, I hope you feel your father's smile. They need to hear from us, Dad. I'm proud of you. And you bring joy to your heavenly father's heart. One last thing they need to, they need to hear is, I'm praying for you. 
And sometimes they need to actually hear those prayers. They need to hear the words, I'm praying for you. And in doing that, we're telling them that I'm, I'm, we're teaching them to turn to God the Father. We're teaching them that's where they ultimately need to turn always. But beyond that, our, our prayers for them can be a roadmap that shows them who they can become and what they can do. When you think about it, prayers are always about, about what isn't, what isn't, or what isn't fully realized yet. Prayers are always for what might be. And prayers are a way that if we let them in on them, and we're specific, say, I'm praying for you for this, can give them this roadmap, give them this vision of what their life might be like, what they might do, like who they might become, this vision for them. Some men that have been to Catalyst, not all of them, but some have heard me tell this story. Um, before we had our first son, Marie and I were, were pregnant. And several months into pregnancy, we had a miscarriage and lost that child. In that first pregnancy, I, I did not know if God existed yet, but I thought he might. I'd grown up in church my whole life, still going to church my whole life, and thought he might. So there were these um, prayers of if there's someone up there for this first pregnancy. And the prayers were along the lines of, uh, you know, please um, let this, you know, child we're about to have boy or girl be smart and athletic and good looking and all that kind of stuff and all that and if, if there's anyone they're listening that's my prayer and then we lose that child to miscarriage so soon after Marie becomes pregnant again and this this will be with our first son and so my prayers begin for this son please let this child be smart and athletic and all those things and just a little while in maybe a couple weeks I realized whoa 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 there's something much more important than that and so I began to pray, please let this child be healthy. If there's anyone listening, please let this child be healthy. And then a couple of weeks into that, I realized there was something much, much bigger than health. My prayers began to be, if there's anyone that actually hears this, and what I ask is that this child come to know you. Truth is, I didn't know this God yet. But my prayer was, if there's actually anyone listening, I th the biggest prayer for my child is this prayer, this child would come to know you, God. That, that was my first prayer for our first son. That was my prayer for our second son before he was born as well. But there have been so many prayers since then. There have been prayers for our sons to find and make good friends. Uh, when they each came to faith, prayers for them to come to know Jesus better and better, prayers to follow him better. Uh, there have been prayers for them to hear God speak in scripture. There have been prayers for them to discern how God wired them, how he gifted them. There have been prayers for them uh, that God would lead them in dating or relationships, prayers for them to lead them toward a career and lead them in a career. There have been prayers for them when they have moved different places, prayers for them to find a church home, on and on and on. And throughout the journey, so many times I've said to them, I'm praying for you about X, Y, Z. The message is, I'm taking your needs, great and small, to our Heavenly Father. I'm taking your needs, great and small, to our Heavenly Father. One of the core values of the harbor, I think, applies right here. We say that the work of the church is first and foremost prayer, by which all other work is led empowered and supported. And I would say to us fathers, I would say the work of a father is first and foremost prayer by which all other work is led, empowered, and supported. I would say that. And so if you're a father out there and you're not even sure if God exists, then I would encourage you to, to, to pray in light of that. To, to pray and say, if there's anyone hearing this, this is what I'm asking for my son or my daughter, for my kids. This is what I'm asking. Because I believe that your work is first and foremost as a father is prayer. And everything else will be led, empowered, and supported by that. Bearing the name father is a high honor. One of the highest honors. It's a daunting responsibility. But God knows the fathers you and I can become. He knows that. And it's never too late to start to grow, to learn. Hear me, fathers. It is never too late to start to grow, to learn. 
Proverbs 18, 21 says, the tongue can bring death or life. Fathers, there are some life-giving words from us that our kids need to hear. They need to hear, I'm sorry, please forgive me. They need to hear, I love you. They need to hear, I'm proud of you. They need to hear, I'm praying for you. Dads, lean into these with me. And lean into these with me perhaps today, perhaps this week, in the weeks and months to come. Lean into these with me as a father as well. Your kids, my kids will be blessed by this, deeply, deeply blessed by this. We're gonna conclude this service with a special song and, and we chose it today for you that are dads, for you that are fathers. And, and it talks about God being for us. There's this declaration that, that says that God is for us, God is for you, God is for me. And there's this, this request that God is longing for us to ask and he's longing to fulfill, where, where it's this declaration of, of may his face shine upon us, us dads, us fathers. And, and on, on a thousand generations, may his face shine upon our families and our children and their children and their children. So dads, after I pray, I would invite you especially, and then all the others joining us as well, to, to sing out and make this declaration. Father in heaven, you chose those of us that are fathers intentionally for this role. And you long for us to be a reflection of who you are. And you know where we are now. You know who we can become. You know how to, to guide us and grow us and get us there. And I take great hope in that. And every dad in this audience should take great hope in that. You're not caught off guard by any dad being a dad <laughs> in this audience. You're not caught off guard by where we are, by how far we are from being that reflection, not at all. You're offering to us this day this great hope, this great encouragement that this is a season, this is a time, there, there's a specific way even now around our very words that we can more and more become the dad you made us to be. We can more and more shine this reflection upon who you are, Father. Thank you so much for being for us, Father. Thank you for shining your face upon us. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.